what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows on it. Sure, the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of God is the same forever. Amen. All right. So this is a further expansion of previous week's sermon about what do we do with this huge news that God's eternal plan to glorify himself through the church and manifest this multifaceted wisdom through the church, what do we do with that wonderful announcement? We were called to action, to prayer. Prayer as households and families, not just as individuals doing our own thing. We're called to ask that God would give us Holy Spirit power to be strengthened, that Christ will dwell richly in our hearts. And then... Today it says, adding to that, it may be rooted and grounded in love. Meaning that as you're going to be called to go deeper into the love of Christ, to continue the adventure and press on, you're called to do so as one who is rooted and already grounded in love. Meaning that your pursuit of God's love in growing ways must come from the love that you already possess and are rooted and grounded in. Meaning that your pursuit of deep deepness in the love of God is not a quest for salvation, a quest to be loved, but it is coming from having been rooted and grounded in love already. We want to go further in what we have, but we must know that we truly have saving love. We are grounded in it as we pursue depth in it. And I said last Sunday that we're going to hear a bunch of exhortations in Ephesians. We're going to be called to unity. We're going to be called to sing the psalms. We're going to be called to expose the darkness and not be cowards and hide. We're going to be called to lead as Christ and to submit. We're going to be called to work in a certain way. We're going to be called to be sexually pure, work unto the Lord. We're going to be called to warfare. And before we can hear more of those calls, we must first pray that God saturate our hearts by the power of the Spirit with great and deep affection in Christ. So when you hear Christ call you to something, there is a rootedness of affection that grounds as you hear. Another way I can say this is that we need to have an ocean-like piety. We need to have an ocean-like piety. You need to have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know love of Christ. There needs to be this ocean that is (laughs) never exhausted in its massiveness of God's love that we pursue. We need to see the love of God in ocean-like terms and not like a big lake or a river. See, the love of Christ is an ocean that you never exhaust. It's not simply the elemental things of Christianity. If you think that God's love is something just for newer folks, if you think that God's love as a pursuit and adventure that you never exhaust is something for newer Christians, you're clearly not understanding the love of God. This is a never-ending ongoing discovery to grow in the affection that God has for us. You know why God's love is inexhaustible and a never-ending quest? Because of God's character. See, God is infinite, which means that to understand his love has an infinitive likeness to it that you will never exhaust. Do you realize that you will, in heaven, forever and ever, never even get close to exhausting the magnitude of Christ's love. So why would it be something that you have figured out already? Paul says you need the strength to be able to know this. 
The reality is, is God's love is so immense that if God not gave you the strength to bear it, it would crush and overwhelm you. There's been moments in my life where I thought about the love of Christ and I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack and collapse. God, give me the strength to be able to bear the magnitude of your love. And by the way, this love that we understand, it's something that God has to supernaturally enable us to. See, this is not automatic. You're not automatically going to just go deep in the affection of Christ. Love is not something that just comes out of you naturally. It's something that the Spirit of God is shedding abroad regularly through the work of Jesus. That's Romans 5. The love of God is something that we must put ourselves in intentionally, keep ourselves in, like it says in Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God. John 15, if you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. Let me tell you something. If God's love, according to 1 John, is in this, and Jesus being the propitiation of our sins, meaning that the love of God is known by you in you seeing that you are worthy of divine wrath and judgment, and Jesus absorbed and received that judgment, if that's the love of God, you're not going to love God too much if you don't see yourself as worthy of an infinite wrath. If you want to know the love of God in inexhaustible and exhilarating ways, then you must understand the magnitude of your sin and misery and God's righteous justice for your sin. If we don't have this ocean-like desire to know the love of God more and more, we will constantly be afraid all the time. That's why John says this. Let me find myself here. First John 4. Here is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. You're going to be constantly scared of death if you're not in this pursuit. You're going to be constantly bored and antsy if you don't embrace this ocean-like pursuit. You will constantly be thinking that God's commands are legalistic if you don't go inexhaustibly deep into the love of God in Christ. You're not going to love his commands as you ought if you don't pursue this quest of ocean-like joy and depth in the love of God. And you're not going to hate sin as you ought. Beloved, the, the psalmist in Psalm 97 says, you who love the Lord, you hate evil. You know why you don't hate evil? It's not because you're loving. A deep love for the Lord will bring you to deeply despise evil. You don't hate enough because you don't love enough. The reason why your love for the church can be fickle and blown away so easy. The reason why your wife's weaknesses and sins are so earth-shattering is that you have a superficial understanding of the love of the Son of God for you. The reason why you're so not willing to suffer for the gospel or for Christianity, and the second that pressure comes, you start backpedaling, it's because you've not gone deeply into this pursuit of the height and the breadth and the length. See, Paul wants us to understand every angle of the love of God. There's contours, right? There's parameters. We tend to look at one, right? He wants us to see the totality of God's love, the extent of it. The love of God that dies for his bride and the love of God that simultaneously drowns the army seeking to assault his bride is ocean-like, inexhaustible love. And I want to challenge you and call you that when you see more of the contours of God's love, that when you're surprised and you learn something about the magnitude of God's love, when you go deeper into the ocean, 
that you be willingly able to be surprised and blown away rather than say, you know what? This looks too large for me now. I'm not comfortable. Let me dial back some. Let me give an example of this. So oftentimes you'll see Christians, uh, they discover the doctrine of election. That God elects some and not others. And then, you know, the Christian's knee-jerk response will be what? I can't love a God like that. You discovered something about the love of God that fractured your little finiteness. And instead of being, what? I'm being brought deeper into this magnitude, this mystery. Lord, tell me more about this love that is an electing love. It's the love of God, when you begin to learn more about it and go deeper in, it will surprise you. It will humble you. But there's a tendency for us to be like, you know what? I like the love of God with my little paddle boat and my little six, four-foot little, you know, canoe. Th- my, my, my canoe in this little four-foot, like, river, you know? I don't feel that overwhelmed. But, but Paul wants us to see the magnitude of the love of Christ in all of its facets and go deeper because it is extensive, beloved. I mean, when Paul says breadth, and depth, he's saying that it is massively extensive. Massively extensive. And numbers of sins that you've committed, the love of God meets you in the extensive sinning, in great sinning, in severe sinning, in all types of sinning, the love of God redeems and sanctifies. I mean, just think about this list about love of God for those who are redeemed. This is in Romans 1. Why is this, why is this doing this to me? Why is Romans 1 blank? Hold on. All right. It's here. You think about the love of God and how, how, how the, the breadth of it. Think of this. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness, lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature around the creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason God gave them up to vile, vile passions, the women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men having, leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error which is due. And even they did not honor, retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a debased mind to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, The love of God is in all of those things, redeeming sinners. How extensive is its breath? All types, the Saul types, the woman at the well types, the rich, the poor. See, the love of God has a breath that is overwhelmingly, massively superior to the extensiveness of all of your sins, all types. And what I think oftentimes happens is that Christians tend to think of God's love in their sin, particularly kind of like as far as your arms can go. You know what I'm saying? Your arms can go this far, and there's certain things in your life that you don't see his redemptive, sanctifying love permeating and touching, and you don't bring them to them. This is why many of you are haunted by your past. So many of you are even haunted by your present because you have a limitation. You have a making smaller of the breath and the magnitude of the love of Christ. You qualify it. And you're scared to be honest about certain sins in your own life 
or you're scared to talk about the sins of others in their lives. But God proves his love in what? In that you were an enemy. You were a hater of God. You were a conspirer with the devil. You were wicked and evil and hideous. In the love of God, in the breath of it, that's where it comes. God has chosen to magnify his glory in saving those who are his arch enemies. In their viciousness, in their treason, this is the love of God. I was talking one time to a pastor. I don't think he was a pastor. He was somebody in Cuba. And he was talking about how he feels about, you know, the whole thing of homosexuality. And he's like, you know what? We've got to love. We've got to love those people, you know. So, yeah, what do you mean by that? Yeah, we can't condemn them. And I says, okay, so you want to hate them. I said, what are you talking about? If God proves his love in our sin, Right? And that person's choice sin is sodomy. How is that person going to know the love of God? By understanding that Jesus Christ took on sodomy and was judged. That's how they will know love. You are hating them and leading them to be haters of God. You're limiting the love of God. And you're saying, well, we can preach his redeeming love for these kinds of sins. And sinners, but with those, we'll just say, you're okay. Beloved, you are limiting the breadth and the depth of love of God when you are scared to say that certain things need to be washed. See, Revelation says that he loves us by what? By washing our sins by his blood. Not by you doing pilot-like stuff. You clean up stuff and lighten it on your own. No, the only love that is truly love is that which washes. The kind of love, apparently, Jeffrey Dahmer came to faith in jail. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That person ate people. And let me tell you something. There is not one person that has done something that the breadth and depth of the love of God in Christ cannot undo and conquer. It's deep, (laughs) profound. It looks at Saul on his way to murder Christians and says, I'm going to call you. It looks at the woman caught in adultery and says, your sins are forgiven. It looks at the sinner next to Christ, mocking Christ in his torture, and says, today you will be with me in paradise. (laughs) It looks at the demon-worshiping witches in Ephesus and writes this letter and saying, you are predestined for adoption. This is deep. This is the kind of love... That Christ, being eternal, having no lack, no need, all heaven worshiping him at all times, decided to have to breastfeed. The one who never experienced any kind of affliction and weakness became a human who needs to breathe and eat. He who gave the laws to obey loved in such a way that he obeyed his own laws that he gave for the people who hated him and rejected him. And that love submitted itself to the point of being brutally mangled, tortured, spit on, flesh ripped off, hung naked, stapled to a tree, suffocating where the eternal wrath of God was poured out on him on top of all of that humiliating, excruciating pain. And the man who created life, the man who sustains breath, 
took a last breath and died. He went in the tomb. The depth, the extensive depth of the love of God. It's the love of God that looks at those, looks at Israel, mocking, laughing, get off the cross, and says, Father, forgive them. You know when God answered that prayer? In Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came and convicted wicked Israel of their sin, and they said, what shall we do to be saved? The Lord Jesus made that request as a people he came to save were mocking him in his weakest moments. The love of God. (laughs) It is wide and deep. But it's not just wide and deep. It's also supreme and timeless. It's supreme and timeless. Let me make sure I, where's my timer at? Talking about love of God, I might, get, I might get lost right here. The depth and the width and the length. The length speaks about how long it is. It's, it's supreme infinitude, okay? The love of God has a supreme, superior length. God says to his people, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Ephesians 1, he says he loved us before the foundation of the world. Revelation 14 says that there's a lamb of the book of life that was written before the foundation of the world. It's an immutable love, an unchanging love, an eternal love, an omniscient love, an omnipresent love, a wise love, a supreme and superior love with amazing length. Beloved, what Paul is saying is he wants you to understand is that there has never been a time where God did not love his people. Think about this. How long is God? Forever. God is forever. There has never been a time in God's forever that he did not infinitely love love his people. So when you see all of your timelines and your moments and your ups and downs and you're like, oh, I wonder if God loves me because you're in some kind of uh, difficulty, consider the length. God didn't start loving you when he sent Christ. God's love did not start when Jesus died. God's love has no beginning. The cross was an expression of the infinitude of God's never-ending, in himself love, expressed in time and history. Which is why works-based salvation is an offense to the love of God. You're baptized. Get some grace. And how you live from baptism to death will contingently determine the saving love of God. God's love for his people is not based upon how they act post-baptism. God's love is not Arminian. I love you so long as you make the choice. No. No. It's not based on your choice. It's not based upon your fruits. It is based upon his infinite length to love despite and not because of you. Beloved, God's love has absolutely nothing to do with any of your life. It has everything to do with what is in himself. The length of it. It is long. Beloved, this is the love that God has for the saints, not for just every, every person. If you were made to be loved by one who is eternal, let me tell you this. 
you are going to waste your time and make all the people in your life miserable that you're trying to get your deepest sense of affection from that is not this one. You were made to find your deepest sense of affection in one who is affection has no length because it's eternal. You will never get that from your kids. You will never get that from your wife. You will never get that from your, your, your husband. It is only this that scratches the itch of this desire. <laughs> Which means that if you want to love someone deeply, you will do everything in your imperfect love to connect them to this infinite love. This is what true love is. True love is, is not you, bro. True love is, is giving people what is best. And in all of your loving, you are seeking to bring people to experience and pursue and prioritize the length of the ultimate love of God. That is what it is to be loving. Ultimate love is not love of country, love of culture, love of self, love of kin, Ultimate love is not the love languages. Ultimate love is this, beloved. This is not based upon how you feel about it. I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter. It's not based upon how mature you are. <laughs> this love, because of its length, when you run, it will chase you. When you resist, it will tackle you. When you harden your heart against it, it will soften you. When you deny it, in some ways, it will declare itself to you. You ever, you ever screamed at God before? I have. God's love has a length that drowns out your screams. You know the love of Christ is? He's looking at Peter. Peter, you're going to deny me. But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, you will strengthen your brother. See, you're going to deny me, but guess what? I'm going to chase you. That's the love of God. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. You can't break it. It breaks you. It's length. It's width. It's breath. It's breath. Beloved, you need to get some of this length like love in your life. Because when you understand that God's love goes as far as God, your motives for the Christian life will become very simple. You're doing everything not to get attention, not to prove yourself, not to feel good about yourself, not to provoke God. You're doing everything because, like Paul says, the love of Christ compels me. The love that I have that goes beyond time into eternity. It is a love that has a length, but also has a height. Height. So this love that is deep, this love that is wide, this love that is long, it has a height. It raises you to something. It doesn't just leave you there. It raises. This is the love in Ephesians 2.5 takes you in death and seats you in the heavenly places with Christ. The height of it, the love of God. See, I was talking to someone about my sermon uh, last Sunday, and they, and they were asked a good question. Like, they said, what about compassion? You talk about power and power. What about compassion? I said, God's compassion is powerful, and it lifts you up. It's not just sitting there in a ditch with you. God's compassion has a height to it. It's the one that looks at a person smelly in a tomb for four days and says, get up. It's the one that looks at a wicked person and justifies the wicked. The one that looks at an enemy and makes them a son. The one that looks at a slave and makes them free. It is, it is a love that has a height. It raises it takes people that are tree worshipers, bug worshipers, moon worshipers, Mary worshipers, and it makes them Christ Worshippers. It raises, makes thieves hard workers. 
makes liars truthful, makes the Pharisees grace-centered, makes cowards courageous, makes the sexual fornicator a covenant keeper with a spouse, makes the homosexual heterosexual. You say, oh, you went too far. You don't know about the love of God. You don't know about the height and the length and the width of it. God's love takes everything and raises it. Is it messy? Yes. But it indeed takes angry men and makes them gentle. It takes awful dads and makes them competent. It takes whining, gossiping, bitter women and makes them joyous, gold mouth lovers and builders up of people. It has a height to it, a great height. It takes paganism that has riddled families for centuries and decades and reverses. It takes those who were defeated by sin to defeat their sin and put it to death. See, there's a height to the love of God. There's a height. It takes lesbian activists and makes them spouses of covenanters. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Not he gets us, he saves us, right? Amen. Rosaria was a lesbian activist in academia, and the love of God did not just come to her and say, you're forgiven and you're going to go to heaven. It raised her to a height, to a life that is different. The love of God is high. <laughs> it raises, it reforms. Sometimes I wonder, like, Lord, like, why did you save me when I was, like, most hating you? you get, I, God, I, I spent most of my, everyone hates God that's not a Christian, okay? The Bible says they're haters of God. Like, I don't hate God. I don't even think about that. I don't even hate, think about him. Yeah, you hate him. The whole, his whole glory is manifest all over the universe, and your mind, he gave you uh, image bearing and a conscience to think about him, and you know he exists, and you don't think about him, you hate him. Imagine, like, <laughs> your wife lives with you, and you're like, uh, uh, I see you all the time, everywhere, I just don't think about you, you hate her. So I wonder, like, why is it that when I got super atheistic and super anti-God, and, and I started getting, getting very, 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 like, passionate about my God hatred, like, why is it that at that moment God saved me? Couldn't, couldn't God have saved me, like, before when I was kind of, like, indifferent? God is making points that he pursues people in the most strange times at, at times and then shows the length of his love in that pursuit of that greatly contrary person. And I want to ask you a question this morning, beloved. Are you praying that this love that has great breath and depth be raising you from sins in your life that you still struggle with? See, Paul says you should be praying for these things. You should be asking for these things. You should be pleading for these things so you can understand the height. See, God's not done with you. God still wants to show you something about the height of his love. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. But I want to say a few more things about this love. And I say a few more things. I don't know. Maybe it's three, four. This love that is high, this love that is long, this love that is wide, this love that is supreme is collectively understood. Look, he says, I want you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The love of Christ for all the saints. All the saints. Meaning that God wants you to know a love that doesn't make some kind of saint kind of more saintly. Right? It's not a privatized love. It's not a, it, it, is, it is a love that is high, wide, deep for the totality of the saints. Beloved, God wants you to know this kind of love, not just with yourself, 
but with the people in this church. He wants you to know the extent of this. Sometimes when I hear Christians talk, it's, it sounds very narcissistic. Um, I, I just, God loves me so much, and he, I'm, I'm so special, and he loves me. Listen, God has a love for you that is deep, that is, is to be experienced in the collective as well. Listen, everyone in here, God does not love any of you with degrees. Do you understand me? And God wants us to experience the angles of his love with the totality of all his people, not just the people you like, not just the people you prefer. God's love, its length and its width and its height is for all the saints, the new saints, the old saints, the extra reformed saints, the all you know reformed saints is. The single saints, the married saints, the empty nester saints, the Anglo saints, the whatever kind of Hispanic saints, the darker saints, the, the love of God is comprehensively deep and long and indiscriminate to all the saints. All of them. The ones that you like a lot and the ones that you like less. All the saints of all the ages and all places with others. The love of God for all the saints. This love that should be understood collectively should also be understood experientially. Experientially. Look what it says in the verse. And I want you to know love of Christ in a way that surpasses knowledge. Now, people make this verse say all sorts of strange things. I want to love, I want to love Christ, and it had nothing to do with my knowledge. You know, no, no. That's idolatry. Paul is saying that I want what you know. I want you to, 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 to not just know. I want you to go further. I want this knowing to be experientially accompanied with deep affection. I want you to know this and love what you know. I want you to experientially, on the ground, smell of this thing that you know about Christ. So it's saying, not bypassing the knowledge, but that it would just not be intellectual. You can't bypass the intellect. And this is something that I think is harder for us in like Presbyterian circles, you know? It's like, oh yeah, you know what, that's pietism, Aldo. All that experiential stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like, like. But Paul is saying that I, I want this love that you know to be something that is known by experience. Like, it is visceral. Like, it's, it's in the soul and fiber of you. Paul wants you to have a love of Christ that will lead you to run through walls for Christ. Instead of saying, well, that wall is six inches thick and it is ten feet high. And if I run through it at this velocity, I'm not, it's a metaphor, right? You get it? If I run through this velocity, then I will, I, will, I will hurt my wrist. No, he wants you to have an experiential passion for Christ that runs through walls and shows itself. He wants you to love the songs you sing about him, not just sing him. He wants you to love the book he wrote about himself and not just read it. He wants you to enjoy him. In real time, he wants the love that he is speaking of here to bring you to an experiential depth that you obey. You obey when it's costly. You obey when it's difficult. It's not just knowledge. It goes beyond and into the life and affections. This is the first question in the larger catechism, right? The chief end of man is what? To glorify God by knowing the Trinity, 
knowing the covenant of grace and the covenant of works. Glorify God by knowing the order salutis and glorify God by knowing the RP. No, enjoying him. I want to enjoy God. Like, Aldo, why are you so, why are you sound like you're having so much joy? Because I'm supposed to be living out what, what, what I'm talking about. This is supposed to be something that is wonderful, joyous, experientially deep, not just factual. Mm-hmm. Beloved, if you are not happy and enjoying your thinking in this church, but you're just getting smarter, you are not praying the way you should pray. Experience without knowledge is idolatry. But knowledge without experiential is idolatry. Beloved, the Lord and his love and what you know about it should bring you to experience this in a way that exceeds the intellect. Do you pray this way? Do you pray this way? And here's the last thought. It really is the last thought. Well, there's many thoughts in my last thought. (laughs) Experiential, but also in a way that's very invasive and reflective. Very invasive and reflective. Listen to this verse. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This fullness theme keeps showing up in Ephesians over and over again. And what God is saying is, listen, this stuff that is in me, my character, I want to fill you with it in every way. I want you to be filled with things that reflect my character in growing in extensive ways. All the fullness of God. That means the the characters of God that are communicable, right? So we can't be omniscient, but we can know things. We can't be holy as God is holy, but we can be holy in creaturely ways. He's saying, I want this that is in me. I want my character to, to flood you so that you are overwhelmed and you reflect me as I fill you. This is speaking about God wanting to permeate us thoroughly. Listen, God does not want you to see your Christianity right now and say, I'm good. More of your thoughts, more of your moments, more of your thinking, more of your actions, more of your life. God wants to, listen, think about this. God does not want to fill you like a bunch of water bottles that you fill up and put in a closet. He, when you think God's filling, think of hurricanes flooding the entire house and picking it up and just, just there's, there's water everywhere. God wants to permeate in growing ways who he is in more and more aspects of your life. He wants you to empty yourself of your fullness of self so that you will reflect something of himself. See, Christianity is not you being full of yourself and recruiting Jesus to then join the parade. Christianity is God emptying you of yourself and cascading me with the spirit of God and this experiential knowledge of Christ in the height and the width and the length and the power of the spirit, you being filled with something more growingly, more deeply, deep, deeply than before. Amen. Beloved, you should never see your Christianity. I don't care. If you're older in Christ, you should be more desperate to be filled than, be, than, than, than me. Because the more, let me tell you something, the more when you encounter the reality of the ocean, the more you see you haven't seen nothing at all. The more you know of this God, the more you're like, I don't know nothing about him yet. But when you domesticate God, you diminish him, you will certainly feel that you are full. Paul is saying that I want... 
the fullness of Christ, to growingly fill every aspect of your life, so there will be zero you and it will be all Christ. And what I love, it says that you may be filled with the fullness of God. See, God wants you to reflect what it means for him to be loving. He wants you to have a fullness that reflects something of who he is, as opposed to you just constantly just casting the reflection of yourself. God's love is truthful. So he wants you to love in a way that reflects his love. God's love is just and holy, so he wants you to reflect his fullness and loving people in a way that's about justice and holiness, not the way people define love. Oh, I'm, sin is cool. It's okay. It's fine. No, we, we, we should be filled with a fullness, right, whereby we reflect something. God's love is sacrificial, so our love should be reflecting a sacrificial love, right? Our love should not be convenient and pragmatic. God's love is bold. God's love loves when it's hard to love. So we should be longing that that love in hard situations would be something that reflects imperfectly in us. God's love throws tables. But it also does not put out smoking flaxes and break broken reeds. See, beloved, when you begin to love more, more, more the way God loves, you know that your love got to throw a table sometimes, but you know your love also has to never not forget the need to not break broken reeds. You want to love the way Christ loves. The one who says, come to me all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the love that looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. That's the love of Christ. I want, beloved, I want to love the way Christ loves me. I want the fullness of the way Christ loved to be the way we love. I don't want to love people like pagans love, think of love. Beloved, I, I don't want even us to love the way generic evangelicalism, superficial, uh, superficial like generic even. I, I want to love the way Christ loves. Amen. I want the fullness of God. I want to reflect the Lord. I want to love wisely, because <laughs> the Lord loves wisely. Love the Christian life is not failure, but fullness. The Christian life is not failure, but fullness. Not fear, but fullness. Not fatalism, but fullness. And we've just begun to scratch the surface. I want to know the height and the width and the length and the depth of love of Christ in a way that surpasses knowledge. The kind of love, you know the kind of love that I want you to have, beloved? It's been 50 minutes and you're like, it's not enough. Amen. It's not enough. Tell me more about this infinite ocean-like piety in the Lord that we have in grace. You've been worshiping since 11, 1230, not enough. We've just begun to scratch the surface. Don't get bored of this pursuit and this quest. Let us continue on the journey. And every time you see something in Ephesians, that you hear sounds too hard to hear, go back to here and get on your knees and pray for God to give you an experiential love you. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have told your people this morning that you are pleased to reveal to them 
and are calling them to embrace and pursue more of what it is to be loved by you in Christ in your spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empty us of our fullness of self so we could long for this fullness. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the length and the breadth and the depth and the height, Lord. I pray that as we come to this meal of grace, this covenant sign of renewal, that we would consider your eternal infinite love and how wide it is and how deep it is. That Jesus really died. He really died for our sins. He really suffered for us. His body really bled. He really suffocated and died. He really endured divine judgment and wrath. And that is love that is manifesting something infinite and eternal that never began. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us that love as we eat and drink signs of your covenant love. I pray that we would uh, 